Hello, so we have... and welcome to Live and Let's Discuss. I'm Jeremy. And I'm Noah. And we didn't just record this, only to find out it didn't actually record all of it. Yeah, definitely didn't happen. No, it didn't happen. Because we are professionals. Yeah, you know? yeah. I look nasty. <laughs> welcome to Pasty Boy Podcast. Um, I, I happen to shave, for those of you... Well, none of you see the video for this. I shaved my beard off, and I feel naked and weird. But anyway, we're going to talk about For Your Eyes Only, both the the book of short stories by Ian Fleming and the Roger Moore film from 1981. So we'll start with the short stories. It's made up of five short stories that were based on scripts for a 007 TV show that never happened. As... um, this is the an era where Fleming was kind of running out of ideas. That's yeah, there was something going on with him because we got this for your eyes only, you know, based on scripts for the show. We got the Thunderball novel, obviously based on a script he co-wrote with uh, Kevin McClory, the real life Bond villain. Yes. Before... Yeah, and then after that, we got uh, everyone's favorites by Who Loved Me, the experimental novel. And on Her Majesty's is weird too. In a way, but I would say most agree that's like him getting back on track. Yeah, and with with Man with the Golden Gun being like back to business, but too little, too late. Yeah, I mean he died while writing it. Yeah. So anyway, this book is based off of uh, five. This has five short stories. We're going to talk about all of them, although only two of them really have to do with the movie for your eyes only. Um, The first is From a View to a Kill, um, which is probably one of the more action-packed ones of this. Uh, The uh, motorcycle dispatch for British intelligence is killed by Smash. Although I don't explicitly think they say it's Smash, but it's implied it's Smash. Um, which this would be the last story with Smash in it. Because moving forward, Spectre becomes the villain. Um, but Bond basically chases this guy on a motorcycle, finds a secret Russian base, and destroys it. That's from a view to a kill. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with A View to a Kill, the movie. Although we'll probably... No Christopher Walken? No no Christopher Walken. No weird karate in a singlet thong thing. No. What we do uh, get, the one thing I remember from the short story, uh, the, the base, the villain base, is like underneath like a forest. Yes. And it's kind of science fiction-y and, or like cartoony the way it's described. Because they have this thing you have on like U-boats, you know, where you look out of. Yes. It feels like Bond movie stuff. Yeah. But uh, next we get For Your Eyes Only, uh, a married couple that was uh, that were friends with M are murdered. Um, M asks Bond to investigate he meets the daughter of the deceased married couple who she's trying to get revenge and bond sort of aids her in that which is the overarching plot of the movie for your eyes only yeah i would say pretty much everything from the short story is in the movie except the m stuff which we will get to yes then we have after we have quantum of solace mm-hmm. which is bond is being told a story about a married couple where the wife cheats on the man over and over again embarrasses him and it's about how much this man can take and then you find out what the quantum of solace means which it's not the coolest thing in the world it's a weird way of explaining how much someone can can how much like pleasure to pain someone can take really Mm -hmm. and this short story was essentially Fleming trying to write like actual literature 
because I don't know how true this is, but apparently his wife invited like other authors and artists into their home at the dinner parties and stuff, and they all made fun of Fleming for writing silly, you know, spy stories. Which is that that sounds like it's such a British way to insult someone. Yeah. But yeah, um, but yeah, quantum quantum is great. It's a really yes. different type of story because there's mm. pretty much no action. It's Bond in the mundane, and mm. he finds something interesting in that. And yeah, I think it's great. Just yeah, something very different. Yes, and we get none of that in the movie. No. Next, we get we go to Risico, which is also in for your eyes only. Which is Bond thinks he's going after a villain, but it's not. They're just criminals. They're smugglers. He ends up raiding, like doing a drug raid, as I recall. And that's pretty much it. Hmm. Which is Bond getting like double crossed, and it's like twist who's the good guy and who is the villain. Mm -hmm. Which is an element we also get in the movie for your eyes only, and pretty much never again except maybe world is not enough in the same vein. Yeah. Then then lastly, we have the Hildebrand Rarity, also known as most of the dark stuff that's in License to Kill, which is Bond and a friend of his are asked to join the Hildebrand, or the, is it the Crests? Yeah, Milton Crest is Milton the guy himself. Crest, um, and his wife, Milton Crest, is just a jerk. He he like acts like a tough guy. He's said to speak like Humphrey Bogart. Uh, he beats his wife with a stingray tail when she misbehaves in his eyes. Um, he's really rude to Bond and his friend. And this is when when they they say they're looking for a fish, they're going to kill it and stuff it and put it in a museum. Mm -hmm. So Bond ends up catching this fish for him, only to find that evening that the fish has been shoved down his throat. <laughs> and Bond finds this dead body and he like contemplates what to do with it. Also, he contemplates domestic violence. I have to point out, this is a book from 1960 where no one talked about this stuff. And I think it's utterly fascinating because Bond's like, is it my place to step in when I see marital problems? Hmm. And, and then, his conclusion is great. Yes. Because he's just like, you know what? He was a jerk. And then he throws his body into the water. Yep, and then it's kind of left open to who actually killed him. Yeah, it's just a great story all around. It is, and it's a great way to end this book. Um, highly recommend reading all of For Your Eyes Only. This book really encapsulates how to write short stories and make them flow with one another. Unlike Octopussy and the Living Daylights, where none of those were meant to be collected as one in one volume. Mm -hmm. These all were meant really to, to, to mesh well. So anyway, we get to the movie for your eyes only Ro allegedly Roger Moore's last movie. Or was it? We, we get that a couple of times with the next movies. Is it his last? Well, we could talk about the opening of this is a weird sequel to On Her Majesty's Secret Service with Bond at Tracy's grave. He gets uh, he gets told that there's a helicopter for him and he needs to go to headquarters. Or they find out that Blofeld is controlling the helicopter, but they can't call him Blofeld because they didn't have the rights to the name Blofeld anymore. Or Spectre, for that matter. They didn't have the rights to either of those. So what we get is just the weirdest hijink, Roger Moore hijinks of... Uh, of any of taking control of the helicopter, 
grabbing Blofeld with the helicopter and dropping him down a chimney. It's the most Roger Moore way of dealing with things, but I kind of love it. Mm -hmm. It's so goofy. But we were talking about how this wasn't necessarily meant to be a Roger Moore film. No, this was supposed to be the start for a new actor. Uh, allegedly, I mean confirmed. And they asked Timothy Dalton, for example, who declined because he saw Moonraker and he saw the direction they were going. <laughs> Second time Dalton declined, which is so wild to me. Um, yep. And so, yeah, that was essentially just why this opening existed. Establishing continuity, this is still the same guy, even though now it's a third new act, you know, actor coming in, playing the part. Mm -hmm. But then Roger Moore was like, okay, you know what, I'm still staying on, I'm going to do this one as well. And the other reason, obviously, Kevin McClory being like, Blofeld belongs to me, Spectre belongs to me, I'm going to make my own Thunderball movie. And Cubby Broccoli was like, we don't need Blofeld. Watch watch me throw him down a chimney. <laughs> oh, just just wait till we get McClory's ideas. Yeah, his magnum opus. That he was willing to remake again. With Dalton, of all people. <laughs> I really wish that would have happened. That would have actually been awesome. Yeah, that would have been fascinating. But um, we we now cut to the great, in my opinion, one of the best title sequences for a Bond movie, which we have the singer of the For Your Eyes Only song actually in the title sequence. It's, it's a major step up from... The effects in Moonraker or Spy Who Loved Me, everything's a lot clearer. It just looks better. And in my opinion, I think it's one of the best ones they ever did. Hmm. Um, so just in terms of like how technically, you know, how it's technically, made. Technically, it doesn't look like CGI crap. That we've like the later movies. Tomorrow Never Dies. Yeah. Um, it's up there with gold. I, I do like Golden Eyes opening too. But mm -hmm. I, this one, I think, is my favorite. It's not... I would say, I, I even on, like, the technical side, I think my favorite would still be From Russia With Love. Because that's... It seems so simple, but mm -hmm. elegant at the same time. But yeah, yeah, this one is still really well made. And I guess I do have to, like, applaud him for, like, including the singer and it doesn't look out of place. Mm -hmm. Which is, like, I mean... She was an attractive woman. She fits in. Like, yeah. imagine, like, Living Daylights. They're going to work in AHA. How that would look like. Or uh, View to a Kill. They're going to uh, put Duran Duran in there. Yeah. I think the only other one that would have really worked would have been Cheryl Crow, I guess. Hmm. Or, even though that song sucks. Song sucks so bad. Yeah, and they had a better alternative. But now they it's the end did. of the song. But Cheryl Crow was popular, so they changed it last minute. But that's we'll get to that mm -hmm. several episodes from now. Mm -hmm. I guess we can say the song itself, I think it's also fine. It's a love song, again. That's the thing with the Roger Moore era. We have yes. like the, the love songs in Roger Moore era. We got the heartbreak songs in the Daniel Craig era. Yeah, well, the, the depression songs, as I like to call them. Mm -hmm. Get me... I'm trying to remember what an antidepressant is. More like, get me Ambium. I feel like Ambium songs, like the last two of them. Like taking Ambium and not sleeping. It's just miserable. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, writings on the wall. Yeah. That might be one of the worst Bond songs ever, and I'm gonna get heat for this. I'm f I think that I think it's fair. I'm pretty sure that song has always been controversial among fans. Because like it's good and then the falsetto hits and the falsetto doesn't fit. And I get like Sam Smith can do that. That's impressive in and of itself. 
I'm not saying Sam Smith is a bad singer. I would never say that. I think Sam Smith's a fantastic singer. But just, it's like, it's like, have you ever seen Joel Schumacher's Phantom of the Opera? No. Okay, so Andrew Lloyd Webber and Joel Schumacher decided to make Phantom of the Opera, which I can't even say it's a Joel Schumacher film because Andrew Lloyd Webber wouldn't let him direct. But the main song, The Phantom of the Opera, um, Andrew Lloyd Webber decided there needed to be guitar riffs in it. And so there's like, like in the middle of the song, and it's it's so embarrassing. It's like wow. that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Okay, sounds like a good analogy. It's just like, you could show off. I mean, like, it doesn't need to be in there. Like, I will yeah. say... Go back to For Your Eyes Only. It's a fine song. Mm -hmm. It's not the most boring song um, of the more songs. There's a few that are kind of... I would almost say Moonraker is weaker than this one. Oh, yeah. Moonraker feels phoned in. Mm -hmm. Everything in Moonraker feels phoned in. But this, this feels... This is better. Yeah. And something just as a side note. A couple of weeks ago, this song played on my local radio station when I was driving home, and I was amazed. <laughs> really? Yeah, because them playing Bond songs almost never happens. Once they played the Duran Duran View to a Kill song at my workplace, and I was flipping out. <laughs> okay, I do love that song. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing I love about that movie. But anyway, so this is a weird bond movie it feels like a transitional film it also feels like an end because mm -hmm. i'm of the opinion that more this was going to be since moore's contract was up he was on a film to film basis contract um i think he intended this to be his last bond movie possibly yeah I mean, it would have made sense. I would still... F I, I really love Roger Moore in this film. Me too. But overall, the way it feels and it's set up, this would also work just perfectly for a new actor, like it was originally intended. So yes. I'm kind of split on it, because I love that we got Roger Moore in a more... Because this is a great film overall, and it's more grounded, and Moore gets to play it somewhat differently than in his previous films, but still mm -hmm. giving a great performance. So I'm kind of split on this. I, yeah. I agree it would have worked great as an ending for him, like a redemption after Moonraker going to yes. Mars. Well, I mean, I think it was initially the end. There wasn't supposed to be a Moonraker. Yeah, obviously, this movie got announced in the end credits of Spy Who Loved Me. So mm -hmm. And... We get some action set pieces, but nothing's as big as Spy Who Loved Me or Moonraker. Yeah, well, not as outrageous, because I really love the, you know, the action scenes in this movie. Yeah, it really feels well like done. On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Yeah. Which I'll makes sense, this. because yeah. it makes sense that it feels that way. Not just because of the opening sequel, um, but also the director is um what's his name john glenn mm -hmm. who was um peter hunt's protege so to speak who obviously directed oh. uh, majesties and john glenn also worked on that one and this is his first you know first time directing a james bond film and he would direct every single one up until license to kill yes that is right okay i like him as a director Oh yeah, I think he's really good, and this is like a great start. Oh yeah, um, this is one of those scripts that really takes things from Fleming's books, because at this point, they didn't have the rights to Casino Royale. They were out of novels. And they, kinda... and they were not allowed to use anything from Spy Who Loved Me. Yes. So what do you do? Oh, you take things that we didn't use from the books and you throw them in the movie. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that can be a little awkward. But I think this one does it the best. Well, I can't say that. 
Licensed Kill, I think, does it the best. This mm -hmm. one does it really well. But... Yeah, because it essentially merges the two short stories for your eyes only and the Risiko. And also it throws in, you know, an action scene from the Live and Let Die novel, which fits in perfectly, I would say. Yeah, they make it a little more extreme for the Roger Moore era. And I have things I want to discuss from that whole sequence. Because okay. I had to watch it twice to really look at things, some, dare I say, cinema sins. Mm. But we'll get to that. Um, big change. No M in this. Um, yeah. The actor had passed when they were making it, but before he'd filmed his scenes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and then out of respect for Bernard Lee, they just said, we're not going to recast him right away. Uh, we're going to give all his lines to like uh, the Bill Tanner character and like Minister of Defense or whatever, and just say M is on leave. He's not here right now. Yes. And then obviously we get a recast in the next movie, Octopussy. The real, the real thing that gets me in this and I've heard this in other reviews, is the the Bond money penny flirting is starting to feel forced. I can see that. It's bit. not super bad in this. Um, from a view to a well, a view to a kill is where it gets really like, uh, because all the actors are in their eighties. Yeah, they're all old, and I don't mind. See, here's the thing. My issue with the Roger Moore era, and at the same time, I have the same issue with um, Never Say Never Again. And I have this issue, I have this issue in No Time to Die, too. But when you stick with a Bond actor for so long, you gotta age up the Bond girls. Mm -hmm. so like I don't have a problem with Money Penny and Bond flirting because they're close to the same age yeah and I mean that's just the general like vibe between them even since like Connery where it's just like yeah, yeah these same same in age like these colleagues just having I wouldn't even call it like romantic flirting it's clearly just fun between it's, two friendly it's, people it's, you know it's a joke it's a joke and mm -hmm. They haven't gotten that since Skyfall. Say what you will about Skyfall. One thing they did right is setting up Money Penny and Bond for that universe, which they did nothing with Inspector and No Time to Die. But, like, they get that. In my opinion, the Brosnan era didn't get that. And, uh, Money Penny is a joke character in that, but this era get like the Moore era still gets that. It's the only person I have I I don't have an issue with Bond flirting with in this because the whole theme is Bond's old. Mm -hmm. This is still that era where you can really believe that Bond served in World War Two. I mean. Roger Moore was born in 1927. <laughs> He's old. Yes, and he does look older in this one. Yes, and it's... I would still say he looks fine. He's like... in great shape, still. Mm -hmm. He can still do his... the I call it the Moore action, because he never really could fight. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. like, he still can... Well... He's not doing a lot of his stunts. Yeah, there's this famous, yeah. like, joke that Roger Moore is the occasional stand-in for the stuntman. Yes, and that's... <laughs> watching these in HD is so... I feel terrible for the filmmakers, because they did the best they could for the time. How were they to know that high definition would happen? Yeah. They would have um, tried harder to hide the nipples in the openings. The... <laughs> There's that. <laughs> there's a lot of, not a lot of a nudity, but there's quite a bit of nudity in this one. Um, mm -hmm. But you can tell when the stunt people are in. In this, yeah. uh, I'm 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 really crapping on this movie, which I don't mean to because this is my favorite Roger Moore film. 
I think it's in my top five favorite Bond films. Mm, that's fair. Um, because everything else, well, with one other thing that I'll, two other things I'll get to, everything else is perfect in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we get the, the, the stupid Lotus again. I hate <laughs> John's. Lotus cars. They're not... They're not cool. They're they're like the most dated looking cars. That's the thing. That's the thing with the seventies had the ugliest stuff. The seventies aesthetic, for the most part, like when it comes to houses, when it comes to technology, it looks stupid. Like yep. everything in Moonraker, just about looks stupid and dated. But now with this one, you can tell. Oh, we are in a different era, and it's getting better. But they yeah. still have the lotuses. But that scene, we can get to it when we get to the scene, but that is one of my favorite moments because that car just gets destroyed. And it's yes. like it's like symbolism, like, oh, remember the fun, like, insane things we did with the lotus? Screw mm-hmm. that. No, we got to oh, get this no. action scene with this regular, really shitty car. Yes. Which I yes. love. That, that is a great scene we will get to. But, uh, so, Bon... So the big thing is that this codex thing, not even quite sure what it does, but it, it's something the, the the KGB wants it. Mm-hmm. The uh, British, um, there's a British boat that had it. It was like a fishing boat that was also like an Intel boat. Mm-hmm. They accidentally hit a mine and it's a complete accident, which I love. Yeah. Um, which is very different because I'm so... It's so we're so used to Spectre typically just messing things up, or super like a Bond villain just blatantly messing things up. Like we had that for two straight movies, where we had a villain is going to destroy the world essentially. Mm-hmm. Well, three because in um, Man with the Golden Gun they tacked that in too. Oh yeah, but that's really a you know blink and you miss it. Like who cares? That was yeah. yeah, but like we've had that three films in a row, mm-hmm. and I love that it's an accident, and they don't have time to hit the self destruct on the codex thing, and so it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. The uh, our Bond girls family they they work for the British Secret Service kind of in Greece, mm-hmm. which gave you know what this gave me. Gave me a Colonel Sun vibe. Mm. With a lot of it, because a lot of that takes place in Greece. I can see it. Um, Not in tone. Um, that book's really dark. Really, it, really uncomfy. This movie's not so much. But this, these, this poor, lovely, older couple is just gunned down by a helicopter. Yeah brutal scene but it's a great scene when we get the setup with the bond girl yes and so now we get why she's invested she's gonna go get revenge take out this hitman that bond's being sent who who okay i'm trying to remember who is bond taking orders from um i think it's bill tanner and the minister of defense it's the minister of defense okay i knew it was bill tanner but they don't actually call him bill tanner I, I don't think so. But it, it is him. Yeah. I think I've heard the actor was like of the opinion that he's actually replacing M. Which I can kind of see in the movie because he's for some reason sitting at M's desk doing yes. his work. So, I don't yeah. like that. Nope. That was just a weird, what do we do with the desk? Like, I don't think that's a real cinema sin necessarily. It's just blocking issues. We have to have someone sit at the desk. I thought it would be funny if Bond sat at the desk. But that that would... We're not in that... That would be a Craig thing. Yeah. That wouldn't be a, necessarily a Roger Moore thing. But we do get my favorite thing that Roger Moore does, which is he knows everything. Hmm. And so the, they talk about the thing that's missing. He's like, oh! And he spouts off, like... Exposition. Yeah, that's, that's a staple of the Roger Moore era. And I love he has it. Like, yeah, this encyclopedic knowledge. 
Yes. And I lo- I wish we had gotten a novelization from Christopher Wood. That would have been nice. You yes, know, apparently have... apparently Christopher Wood wrote a screenplay for this, but it was rejected. And really? they went with uh, Richard Mayborn. Huh. Fascinating. But anyway, so we're bo- both... Uh, Bond goes to this place. He takes the Lotus, which is now orange. Is it? Is it? Or- no, it's I white. I think it's the white. Yes. It's the white one. And I think it's implying that it is the spy who loved me. Lotus. Mm. Or at least it's it's a version of that. That aquatic goofy thing. That car's so... I lo- Don't get me wrong. I love modern Lotus cars. They're really cool looking. But that 70s aesthetic is still there. And they're just ugly. Mm-hmm. Ugly cars. Ugh. We, I, I don't think we get a nice Bond car until the living daylights. <laughs> Poor Roger Moore. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was, I'll tell you what, it was luxury for then. Mm. Um, but like with Roger Moore's bizarre suits... The big old collars, you know, 70s aesthetic. It's not my aesthetic, except for bell bottom jeans. Mm-hmm. I want those to come back for men. But anyway, um, he he infiltrates this pool party where we get full frontal nudity. Yep, two and seconds. we get we get a sleazy 80s. Uh, sexual song playing in the background. We, we get so many speedos. Yes. It, it is just it is just like it's like the beginnings of a porno. And Bond gets captured only to have Bond girl she she, she shoots an arrow. She's she's got a crossbow in this, which, which is, is awesome. awesome. And, and she kills the guy when he doesn't die. It is a weird cut. There's a few really bizarre cuts. In this yeah, movie. that cut is great because we see him in the background. He's about to jump and in the forefront, Bond is being taken away and he blocks him in the background. And yeah. in that second when he jumps and we don't see him because Bond is walking, apparently he gets hit and then he falls dead in the water. Because it, it would have gotten an R rating if we had seen the penetration of Obviously. The so <laughs> that, that, one, that one's better. Than, there's a slap scene. In this movie, that is weird, weirdly edited. But we'll get to that. That's that's in the climax. But uh, Bond ends up escaping, only to have the henchman try to open his car, and then blows the 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 car blows up. Yep. <laughs> and so they have to take this weird. I don't even know what car it is. Is it a Peugeot? I think I looked it up. I think it's a Citroen. Okay. It looked like a Volkswagen. Yeah, oh. that's what I was thinking. But it's this really like goofy looking small little yellow car that has no gadgets, nothing special about it. It doesn't even have a lot of horsepower. No, but we get this entire action scene with it and I love it. Mm-hmm. Like I said, it's like a symbolic oh, we remember the Lotus and all the gadgets. Mm-hmm. Forget about it. We're no, going it back matter. to basic. Yeah, and I love the action sequence with it. Yeah, I mean they I was... flip it upside down. It gets messed up. Oh, it's so destroyed at the end of it. It looks like like if you're driving through GTA and you crash into things. That's the type of damage it takes. You know what it reminds me of? You ever seen Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yes. When he he has he takes the Bronco that has all the all the the part the engine parts are ripped out of it. And he just coasts it down the cliff at the beginning. <laughs> oh man, it's like that. And, and I mean, like they flip over the the car flips over. They switch who's driving because initially she's driving, and I I oh, thought yeah. that was pretty progressive for these movies. But he Bond, of course, has to take over, which is fair because, I mean, 
Yeah. It, He's the got chase more wasn't going through. Well. Mm-hmm. Got more experience. But um But she still got her moment, even when he's driving. Yeah, no, the, you know, is... go forwards and go backwards. This is really the Which first also makes time. which also uh, that doesn't feel forced, for example, no. because it's like of course she knows how this car works and he doesn't because it's this type of car. Yeah. Um it's the, really the first time we see Bond girl holding her own with Bond. Maybe. But yeah, I think that's just a big thing with this character, Melina Havelock. She really much doesn't even feel like a love interest necessarily. She feels very much like equal with yes. her whole revenge plot and everything. I think yeah. that's great. It's a great setup mm-hmm. and her story throughout, investigating on her own. And I think that works really well. Yes. Um, I I like it. I like it because like we've had female agents. I mean, I'll take it back. Spay Love Me is really the first one where we're supposed allegedly we have an equal to Bond as the love interest. But to me, they all because it was the seventies. They always found some sort of way to nerf the Bond girl so the Bond would look awesome. Hmm. Like, Bond's always got to rescue them. Um, or for Holly Goodhead, she just doesn't do anything. Like, ever. Yeah. But in this one with Melina, she has, like, her entire arc with, like... Which I think is taken from the short story where Bond tries to convince her... Like, if she tries to murder him in, in revenge, that wouldn't be good for her. Yes. Uh, the Chinese have a saying... When going after revenge, dig two graves. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And and it in my opinion, it works more, no pun intended, in the film than it does in the book. Because mm-hmm. Bond has gotten his revenge and he got nothing out of it. In the in the modern era, if we had had that, they would have dwelled on it. But I like that they don't dwell on it. Like the whole Blofeld thing doesn't matter anymore. I mean, it's been so long since he even seen Blofeld. It's been like a decade. Yeah. The last you know, time. that's actually interesting, like a thematic element to tie it in with the rest of the film. Mm-hmm. I know you didn't catch on to that. I, not like not consciously, but yeah, you're completely right. I, I, this, I just love it. Like, um, you do... We get our second Star Wars connection in this film. Yeah. First one we didn't mention. Uh, not Blofeld in the beginning is played by Lobot. That's right, yes. Uh, so we have Lobot, and then we have the captain on... Um, okay, uh, that's leading the AT-ATs in Empire. Oh yeah, G- uh, General Veers? General Veers, that's right. Yeah, General Veers is in this. Also, Donovan from Last Crusade, or second Indiana Jones, uh, like actor, because of course we had Sean Connery. Mm-hmm. Which, um, it's so funny how many people in Star Wars are in the Bond films. Because I for, totally forgot... First of all, I didn't know Lobot was in this period. Because you don't even see his face. Yeah, and I don't even think he's credited as, at the end because they didn't want to credit the character as Blofeld because of the lawsuit. Funny. They should have done it like back in the day, you know, from Russia with Love when it was like Blofeld and the actor in the credits, it was like question marks. Yeah, they might have. They should have done the opposite. Credit the actor, and then who does he play? The character? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Fair enough. Um, I'm thinking here. So, I'm trying... We end up... Is this all in Greece? I think this is still in Greece, yeah. It's all in, like, one place. Which is nice, because, like, Moonraker was literally a globe trotting thing. Yeah. He eventually they flew around the the earth. So it's nice that it's all in one place. 
But uh, Bond's trying to uh, meets with Greece intelligence, basically the uh, Felix. Oh Knight. no, that guy was Italian. He was Ita- Italian. What was his name again? Uh, uh, he's basically Felix, but for the Italians. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Uh, we get a new Lotus, which is orange. Which they don't do anything with it, and I like that. Hmm. We already got our, our car chase for the, the film. We don't need another one. Mm-hmm. But uh, we, we meet our, our Bond villain, who we don't think is the Bond villain, who's a smuggler? Yeah. Um, who also has a protege ice skater who's into Bond, but Bond's not into her, and I like that. Yeah, that's because a great element. Because she's a brat. She's mm-hmm. BB, the most obnoxious character since uh, the the Southern Sheriff. Oh, J.W. Pepper. J.W. Pepper. BB's really obnoxious. Mm-hmm. On purpose, clearly. But yeah, oh. I, I still think she's better than Pepper. Well, yeah. I think most people are. <laughs> Yeah. Well, one of these days we'll have to do a top five most obnoxious Bond side characters. Like uh, all the gangsters in um, Diamonds Are Forever. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so she she's into Bond. Bond's not into her because she's basically like a teenager. I don't, I don't... The actor doesn't look like a teenager but it's clear they're making her look like young so i think that's what the implication is yeah i took her as like early 20s or like 19 ish range somewhere. well she's she's naive and bond doesn't want that like at all yeah and, and it has the great the great the greatest line ever because she's trying to seduce him she's naked she... in the bed and bond yeah she's naked but... in the bed and bond is like just get your clothes on, and I'm gonna buy you an ice cream. <laughs> and, and only more could really deliver that line. Yep, like that's a very Roger Moore. Mm-hmm. And what I love about it, it's like we're gonna get to it when we get to View to a Kill. But both this movie and the next one, Octopussy, they subtly allude to the fact that he's getting older. And mm-hmm. they are like an octopusy, like Maud Adams, obviously an older lady as the Bond girl, which is nice. And yes. in this one, they the Bond girl, Melina, is like actually like a build up character. And even though there is a clear age difference, it works better with yes. her. And then they insert this BB character, which is like the what people think of Bond girls. I yes. Guess. And, and it's it, almost it, like they are making fun of the fact, like, we know Roger is old, but we are self-conscious. Like, we know what's going on. Yeah. If this had been Roger Moore in um, Live and Let Die, he would have yes. definitely. But he's he's old now. Like, it's it's so fascinating because we're, we're at we're getting to where I have issues with. Well, I have an issue with the Walther PPK. Can we just get into that? I don't know where All this right. is going to fit. The Walther PPK. I don't know if you're familiar with bullet calibers and stuff. So when Fleming had this issue when he had Bond with the Beretta. The Beretta fired a 25 caliber bullet. That is a tiny, tiny bullet. Um... And the, the we talked about this in the Doctor No review where he gets the he gets the Walther. Well, that was a compromise because uh, someone who was actually in the British Secret Service or in the British military said he would be carrying a Smith and Wesson revolver. And Fleming's like, well, I don't want that. I want I want him carrying an automatic. So that's where we get the Walther PPK, which fires a nine millimeter short. Also in America, it's called a 380. Basically, it's the same bullet size as a nine millimeter, but it doesn't have uh, the shell and the gunpowder's less. 
And 380 is considered the bare minimum, especially nowadays, and even in here, in the 80s, is the bare minimum for self-defense. It's not a very powerful round. And the Walther PPK isn't a very powerful gun. And we get this in the next, I'll talk about this with Octopussy and Never Say Never Again, because they do, they upgrade him to the Walther P5, which was a 9 millimeter handgun same capacity about the same a little bigger but roger moore and sean connery were very tall men so like it fits their hand better it's more comfortable but then but then suddenly when we get to a view to a kill we're back to the walther ppk with no explanation and we stay with the walther ppk until tomorrow never dies in the 90s but here's the thing the walther p5 came out in the 70s the British uh, military adopted it in the either the late seventies or early eighties. So, like, we're at a point where the Walther PPK does not make any sense at all. And then to make matters worse, I, this is a rant. This is something that really bothers me about the Bond films because the Bond films, especially at this point, if we're paying so much attention to how Daniel Craig physically fights when he gets in fist fights and is grappling and all this stuff that's like B Jason Bourne meets John Wick. Why is why is he carrying the Walther PPKS? Why why do we go from back from the P99 a modern well it was it was a little outdated by the time Quantum of Solace came out. But it's a striker fired 9mm pistol. Why are we going back to the PPK? I mean, in No Time to Die, he barely even uses it at the end. They give him a, a Sig Sauer P226. But, like, why? Why are we using the PPK other than nostalgia reasons? It makes no sense to me. No military, no secret service that I'm aware of still uses 380 anything. Don't get me wrong, Walther PPK is an absolute beautiful, beautiful handgun. But their bond, that, that's not something he would carry. It doesn't, it's now at the point, well, now that we're in the 80s and we're really starting to see compact handguns being a thing, it makes no sense why he has it. it it's not effective. I mean, he's shooting through windshields, which that's not possible with most bullets. From a handgun? The reason Dirty Harry carried a Smith & Wesson 20, 29, um, uh, 44 Magnum. I'm almost done with my soapbox, Noah. He looks very bored right now. <laughs> but the reason he carried a Smith & Wesson 29, uh, 44 Magnum is he could shoot someone through a windshield while a car's driving. You can't shoot someone through a windshield with a Walther PPK. You can hit the windshield. It wouldn't. Pro it would bounce off and go somewhere else and probably hit a bystander. But like, <laughs> you, you see what I mean? It doesn't make any sense. Hmm? Rant done. I'm done. All right. All I can add is I don't even remember the PPK in the Brosnan era. I just remember him running around with machine guns. Oh no, he has the PPK in Goldeneye through the whole thing. Oh okay. Um, okay, that he, makes he, sense. That one was more. And he gets the P99 at, in the novelization, Q gives him the P99 in the beginning. In the movie, he gets it from Wei Lin. Okay. And he's like, I've been asking Q for these for a while. Like, making a joke that this there's no reason to have the PPK anymore. It's just so, it's now out of date, is what I'm getting at. All right. Which I guess Bond being older he's out of date but i don't know anyway where were we uh the villain bb sheriff pepper oh well we're about to get to the greatest ski chase in a bond movie oh even better than majesties well majesties in my opinion goes for a little too long but what about the great opening in view to a kill oh, with cow what was it it's the Beach Boys song. Yeah. No. Um, I love pretty much every ski chase in a Bond movie. It's my favorite thing. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I've never skied in my life, but I've always wanted to. But this one's my favorite because there are no gadgets, and Bond nearly loses. Oh yeah, I um, mean, I, lo- I love, I love it as well, especially the end of it. Yes. Should, should I spoil why? Because Bond crashes with his skis at one point. And then yes. the bad guy who's on a motor- motorcycle also crashes in a barn. Mm-hmm. And his thing is broken. His gun it's... doesn't work. So he <laughs> just Bond escapes with his skis. Mm-hmm. And the villain, the henchman, is so angry. First he throws his gun at him. Doesn't do anything. <laughs> and then the he motorcycle. picks up his motorcycle and throws it at Bond. Yeah, that That's the thing. So there's a lot of motorcycles... In this movie, Bond never rides one, but he nearly gets run over by motorcycles several times in this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he gets basically so BB's alleged boyfriend is a KGB member disguised as one a uh, cross country skier that does you know the cross country skiing everyone where uh, they shoot the targets with the twenty two rifle. Mm-hmm. So he's he's an incredible marksman. So he's Bond's equal, essentially. Because Bond's Bond's a marksman. He's a marksman, and um, Bond's trying to figure out who he is. He's with the the villain that was paying the hitman that um, that was killed in the beginning. Yeah, the geeky looking guy with the glasses. Yes. So they're they're in league together with this codex. Um. Mm-hmm. And Bond, Bond, Bond gets chased on his skis by two motorcyclists and another ski. It just keeps building and building, and I love it because it doesn't take itself serious. It takes itself seriously some of the time when it needs to, and it's fun when it needs to. Whereas, yeah. like on Her Majesty's, it's terrifying, especially when he escapes. Blofeld's mm-hmm. hideout. Like, that's a terrifying scene, and I love it. And then him and Tracy like, skiing to escape. Also, it, it's played more fun, but it is kind of scary. This, it goes from scary to goofy to just just weird. I mean, at one point, there's a Roger Moore loses both his ski poles. <laughs> In this, um, he ends up he ends up jumping into a bobsled um, track, which I think is another nod to On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Oh yeah, and the motorcycle gets into the bobsled track too, and it goes on and on and on until we get to the climax, where it's literally they both crash, and Bond just crashed less. So he he get he's able to escape, and then we get the ski, uh, not the ski, the uh, hockey fight. Oh yeah, that one is also great. That's great. Where Bond meets up with BB, and then some guys disguised as hockey players, um, jump him. Yeah. He First they start him. playing actual hockey until yes. BB and the other guy leaves, and then. They start, then lights go out. They start attacking Bond. And my favorite part is that is a good comedy moment that works because he defeats them, beats them up, and throws them into like the, you know, the thing. Yeah. And then it shows like one point for this side. And then at the end, all three points because he defeated all three of them. Yeah. He hits the last one with the Zamboni, the, the vehicle that smooths the ice out. Oh, we didn't mention the other goofy Roger Moore moment, which is in the bobsled. The whole bobsled team looks at Roger Moore and he he does this close up because you know Roger Moore didn't like really do a lot of those stunts, but he would always be on the blue screen and you could always tell it was a blue screen, um, Mm -hmm. which cracks me up every time. It's so so goofy. Uh, The 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 use of blue screens in these early Bond movies. I get that that was the time. But they all look bad. Some of them work. I think the car chase is a good one that works oh, for the yeah. most part. Yeah. It's just the the scene has to be good so you don't notice it. 
Mm -hmm. Um, but we get, gosh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think here. We end up with uh, Bond meets up with our Bond villain, and the Bond villain misleads him into thinking another guy, our smuggler we're going to team up with, is the Bond villain. So Colombo. Colombo. Uh, uh, Bond seduces his mistress. Well, first, we get to see Bond play cards, which I don't think is a thing we've seen in any of the Roger Moore films. Hmm. I don't think we've seen Bond gamble since. Connor. I know we do later in Octopussy. Hmm. I know they go to a casino in Spy You Love Me, but I don't think they actually gamble hmm. in the film. They do in the novelization, but I don't think he gambles in the film. Which is a key thing for Bond. Like, from the hmm. Fleming's books, is Bond's a gambler. He doesn't even care if he wins or loses because money doesn't mean anything to him. He just donates. When he wins, he donates it to a charity. Um, but we see him ga- playing cards, which is fun. Uh, we see him seduce someone hi- close to his age. This is a woman that's yeah. Again, older. again, they are aware. Mm-hmm. And um, she gets run over by a dune buggy. Which yes, unintentionally hilarious. Yeah, it's it's so brutal. It's so, I mean, it's funny because there's no blood because they couldn't have blood. But again, R rating. It does remind me of the dogs eating that poor helicopter pilot in Moonraker. Yeah, I would say that scene was way more intense. Yes, because that that movie is a farce except for that. <laughs> But Bond, Bond ends up um, he ends up fighting with the Doom Buggy people only to be captured by... Which we shall have to point out right now because that's where he gets killed. One of the henchmen, he doesn't even have a name, I think, is played by Charles Dance. Yes, that's right. And I, it was nuts when I realized. I only realized it in that scene when he gets killed. I was like, this looks like a young Charles Dance. That's impossible. That's wild. I didn't notice. I I, I did notice that in this watch along, but I couldn't remember his name. And Bond's captured by the smugglers. He ends up going on an opium raid with them. Of the actual Bond villains lair, which is where the Risico thing comes in. Oh yeah. That that also, that already came in beautifully in the restaurant scene. Mm -hmm. When Bond is sitting there with Christatos, who's the main villain who yes. double crosses Bond, who he mm-hmm. thinks is the good guy at first. And they are sitting at one table. Columbo and his mistress Liesel are at the other table. And then we get like Christatos tries to convince Bond, you may have to kill Columbo, you know, are you ready for that? And then we see like Columbo has had like this setup with like a recorder. Oh, he, and so he, he listens to what they said. That's straight up from the book, from the short story. That's right. Yeah, and that's when we get Columbo wanting to talk to Bond and revealing, no, I'm actually, I'm a bad guy, but not that bad. Like, it's Christatos you want. Yes. And I really like Columbo. I think he's in the same vein as, like, uh, Tracy's dad in yes. Majesties. And I think that was done on purpose. Oh, definitely. So we, we get... We get the raid. The raid's great. It's a fun action scene. Considering Bond didn't kill anyone in Moonraker he straight up murders several people Mm -hmm. like straight up just shoots a bunch of people, blows people up Um, later we we get get to the best kill in the movie the best kill which is we got on my rant about him shooting through the windshield of a car with the Walther but there's a whole sequence where he's running upstairs with Seth Roger Moore running up the stairs is it actually him? I th- it looks like him. Oh, that explains because it was like this the noise in the background when he was running. It's like <sighs> it's probably actually Roger. <laughs> it's the you only can... <laughs> which credit to him, that's a lot of stairs to run. Yeah, up. I love how it cuts back and forth between the bad guy running away in his car, like this high speed change, and then it's like just like Roger <laughs> have to get up the stairs. It's intense. It does work for me. Yeah. 
you you can interpret it as funny. But you like, definitely can, especially if you think, oh, is this actually Roger and not the stuntman? I think it's him. It looks like him. Oh, there's some there's some good trickery, camera trickery to make the stuntman look like Roger in this movie. Um, some of it it's easy to tell because of high definition. Um, but we get the guy crashes his car. He's hanging over a cliff, and Bond said. Bond throws a key into the car and kicks the car down the cliff so the dude falls to his death. Mm -hmm. And I, I love it. That is Roger's darkest moment as Bond. Yes. And next to him shooting uh, Stromberg and the balls in Spy Who Loved Me. Yes. And it's very Connery. Mm-hmm. And I, I do appreciate it. Yeah. And and I mean, the... that scene was so good. They ripped it off with Daniel Craig in No Time to Die. Yes. With the famous I... scene, I heard a brother, his name was Felix Leiter, and then, you know, kicks the car on the guy. Yeah, I've forgotten about that. Yeah, because apparently Craig is a fan of Roger Moore. Huh. Yeah, but yeah, create your own epic moments that's anyway yeah uh we we moved to my the other big cinema sin the scuba diving setting up the oxygen tank so he goes he goes there's a big archaeological uh, scuba dig that there are bond girls supervising and roger moore dives there they meet up and she leaves her scuba tank at the site, I get why it's there because they need it uh, during the action set piece that comes after this. But in, in, in world, what is the logic of leaving that there? I took it as, um, oh, I'm gonna go. We're gonna go up now mm -hmm. for for like a talk or something, and then when I go down. I can swim up until that point, like with no problem, without like having to need like oxygen. But then I'm gonna take it. Like I already have it here. I don't have to put it on when I'm up. Yeah, it's it's a flimsy excuse, but I guess. And we get into the goofiest close-ups, which are not underwater, but they try to make it look like it. Oh, when Roger swims in, and we get a close-up yes. of his face. Yeah. Well, both of them. None of them are under. I I noticed it. It wasn't Roger. I noticed it on her because her makeup's on. Oh, okay. And you wouldn't have that. That would have all washed off. Obviously, okay, okay, that makes sense. Which they um, they they somehow tricked me. I will admit. Okay. Well, you're watching on on DVD. It looks fine. Oh yeah, it did. On Blu-ray, it looks wrong. Mm. Because all the blues are enhanced. And this movie's really blue. <laughs> so a lot of things don't look correct. Um, so I need to watch this in 4K and see. But um, they end up taking a submarine and they get the codex, which leads to an awesome like mech fight. Yeah, with the this awesome like suit that was set up in the uh, heist scene, you know, when they attack Cristado space. Yes, and they get a cool fight. I'll leave it vague because y'all need to check it out. It's it's pretty intense. Mm -hmm. And then One they get the a best... submarine fight, which is also awesome and intense. Yes, and then and I, mean, I guess that's the best. I guess it's the best underwater action scenes we had since Thunderball. Yeah. Probably. And even Thunderball in comparison was slower, definitely. Well, yeah. But this one is just like, bam, bam, bam. Yeah. With different scenarios. And then, then we get to reenacting the climax of Live and Let Die the novel. Mm -hmm. Bond, they're going to be dragged underwater through a coral reef so the sharks will eat them. Mm -hmm. Which, it's... 90% the stunt people. Ten per any close-ups, it's them, but 
we we get more of this goofy close up underwater effect which doesn't look right um but it's a good se- it's a good sequence but like the close ups look really fake like they mm. look like they're from the 50s ouch like in high definition it doesn't look right at all and i say this with a lot of these movies i think until we get to the 90s movies are gonna, the movies are going to look funky in high def i mean some of like the early connery films are not in the right aspect ratio they're in a really weird up until thunderball none of them are in widescreen hmm. it's a really weird aspect ratio it's not quite it's not four by eight but it's it's not 16 by nine it's like 12 by something it's it's really it's really hard to explain but we go from that to the climax of the film. Yeah. Where villains got the codex going to give it to uh, General Gorgorov? Gogol. Gogol, thank you. General. Yeah. Gogol. Who is, I love, I love him as a character in oh, every so film fun. when he shows up. And he's... in this one, his intro is great. Oh, because yeah. I, we... we get these awesome scenes. So, first we get the British. They learn, oh, this, this thing is missing. That's going to cause us problems. And then the Russians, we cut to him in his office. And it's the same one from Spy Who Loved Me. It's like this yes. giant, gothic, empty room. And it's just his, his desk in the forefront. And like in the background, there's his secretary. And he gets the call like, oh, yeah, sure, we're going to get that. Yeah. And then he's just flirting with his secretary throughout the rest of the scene. Yes. Um, but Bond and smugglers, they all end up infiltrating a base there's a great rock climbing sequence Mm -hmm. just fun um it really just because it's very there's not a lot of extras in it and i love that Mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of people it's not like a big army it's not spy who love me where we have all these people shooting at one another it's it's very small scale Bond yeah. throws a guy off a cliff uh, after he slaps BB. It, no, no. The Bond villain slaps BB and it's a weird jump cut. It's sped up and it's a jump cut. So I guess he slapped her really soft. Like she's, he, they, his hand makes contact with her, but I think he just did this. And Probably. Like, and so they speed it up and then they cut and she's on the ground. And it's just bizarre. It's a really weird edit. And um, our our Bond girl does not get her revenge. Yeah, and but Colombo that... takes out his enemy. Yes, and that's nice. And Bond throws the the Codex thing off the cliff. I keep calling it Codex. I can't remember what it's called. Something with an A Ector. Yeah, so- something or Elector or something. I don't know. It it's it's a it basic it's like a decoder. I'm looking it up right now just because why not? You know, it kind of reminds A-tech. me ATEC. ATAC. It's the ATEC. It, it reminds me of the thing in from Russia with love. Oh yeah, the Spectre device. The spe- yeah. And he Bond throws it off a cliff and we get just the best reaction of no one has it now. Yeah. It Again, epic matter. general Google moment. He just laughs and leaves. and Yeah. That's Case cool. closed. Well, well, then we get the terrible Margaret Thatcher scene. Yeah. That's the weak point. The weak ending. It's so dated. It's the most dated thing in this whole... Aside from the, the Lotus. <laughs> it's the most dated thing. Um... And we get the parrot talking to Margaret Thatcher. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Then we get some naked swimming with Bond e- and e- Melina. Yes. Yeah. Melina. And it worked. It's it's a solid movie. It's a really mm-hmm. one of my favorites. I think Moore's best film as Bond. I, I would agree. I think this may be his best performance. 
next to yes. Spy Who Loved Me, where he first got, you know, became he his own got persona. With it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Doesn't try to be Conry. Yeah. And I think this one works. Again, I'm wondering, because we know what comes later with his actual last one. If this would have been better if it was the beginning of like the Dalton era because I can see him in this this seems more like the type of film that would suit him but see, I would I would argue the Dalton era should have started with Octopussy hmm. which was almost a thing yeah okay so anyway but yeah again I would say Roger great performance different than his usual stuff I like that it's more grounded and small scale and yeah. what I noticed, because a lot of people told me, like, this movie is boring because it's so low scale. I disagree, especially on this I rewatch, know. which I just did today. Mm-hmm. The first half, especially, is really fast paced. Like, it immediately grabs my attention. And every couple scenes, there's a new awesome action scene. And it's a lot of variety as well. Like I said, the car chase, we get the ski stuff. Yes. Like it's and then the revenge plot with Melina, which is something different. And I think that's maybe my critique. I think the actress is uh, great, probably subjective opinion, the most attractive Bond girl of Moore's well. era. Um, and I really like her plot. Like her as a character works, not mm-hmm. just as a love interest, but just like the setup when her parents get killed and it zooms in on her eyes and she looks into camera. I love it. I think at the end there could have been more done with it yeah because like you said you appreciate that it's not like this big emotional stuff which i agree with thinking what they would do today Mm. there there would be like sad music playing and they would you know wouldn't work cheesy dialogue and stuff yeah it would be like quantum of solace oh yeah That, that that's the prime example of that where like some of that's a little satisfying but it's so incompetently done that Mm. it just it's just a mess. Meanwhile, Daniel Craig's getting attacked with a fire axe. But yeah. anyway, anyway, that that was for your eyes only. Great film. And yeah, great first outing for John Glenn as a director. Yes. 